This is the 46th Presentations and the Visions of the Kingdom Age series. Our current considerations have developed from the detailed descriptions of the Cherubim. The Cherubim are shadow projections of the immortalized Christ and the saints. Therefore, pursuing an understanding of the intentionally complex testimony of the Cherubim will highlight both features of immortality and the qualifications for being chosen by Christ to become the substance casting these cherubim shadows. In other words, how to qualify to become the immortalized saints. Therefore, the rather odd description of those foundational feet of the cherubim as being cloven calf hooves should offer significant insight into the foundational understandings and divinely approved walk of those within the enlightened community whose primary focus in life his understanding and demonstrating the righteousness of our Heavenly Father and His Son. We've considered the very extensive and absolutely undeniable pattern of the number two in both complementary avenues of divine testimony, both the Bible and the order of creation. Yahweh has assigned the number two to represent spiritual balance. This is because there are two separate categories to every divine principle without exception. The common avenue of failure within the enlightened community over the last two or three generations has been to oversimplify divine principles by insisting these principles only have a single application, uh, thereby imbalancing our spiritual understandings and initiating a falling domino-like progression of misunderstandings about the terms of our Creator's righteousness. Historically, this has even resulted in fellowship separations. However, now in the final years of this last generation of the Ecclesial Age, just before the introduction of the Kingdom, there is a rapidly growing Laodicean ambivalence within the enlightened community, insisting that we respect diverse and contradictory understandings of the terms of our Creator's righteousness in order to pursue the flesh goal of unity among men at the expense of the divine goal of harmony with God. We've reviewed the two resurrection categories, the resurrection back to mortality, awakening, uh, that will precede judgment to be experienced by many, and also the resurrection to immortality, uh, a covering a new birth that follows judgment to be experienced by a few. We have reviewed the two death categories, the temporary death of those accountable to Christ's judgment and the permanent death of all those who will not participate in that resurrection to immortality. We reviewed the two basic categories of life, being mortality and immortality, and then recognized each had a dual subcategory, as the underived immortality of our Creator had no origin, unlike the derived mortality of angels, Christ, and the saints that all had and have origins. Even mortality has seen two categories, with the original life enjoyed by Adam and Eve, prior to the curse of death, being an undying nature, void of disease, aging, decay, or shame. We have reviewed the two categories of sin, being guilty, transgressional sin that requires repentance, and guilt-free sin nature that needs no repentance, uh, but God demands a cleansing. That, the, that, that is the sin category that Jesus brought to his crucifixion. We've also reviewed the two atonement categories of sin forgiveness and sin cleansing or purging. Now we'll continue with our considerations of the two categories of every divine principle and how one category is systematically being repeatedly denied by a growing number of teachers, exhorters, and authors within the enlightened community in this generation. There are also two categories of righteousness in this consistent divine testimony pattern. There is imputed righteousness that is assigned according to faith and not directly according to deeds although it is indirectly related to deeds, since if we have no works, that proves we have a dead faith, and therefore incapable of securing that necessary imputed righteousness. There is also personal righteousness that is divinely assigned according to how we individually 
demonstrate our Creator's righteousness in our personal words and deeds. Our words and deeds are repeatedly expressed as being the basis for Christ's judgment to determine if we will live forever or die forever. Therefore, eroding the significance of developing personal righteousness is a very dangerous contradiction of divine principles. But it is being done with increasing frequency in our last generation of the ecclesial age. More and more of our teachers and writers are insisting that imputed righteousness is the exclusive righteousness category, and that any claim to personal righteousness will supposedly compete with God's exclusive righteousness. Of course there's no righteousness at all apart from our Creator. That's a premise accepted by everyone. The point of differenti differentiation on the basis of the term personal is certainly not with our Creator, but with each other. This category of personal righteousness is actually the, uh, the individual and personal manifestation of God's rightness on the basis of our individual and personal words and deeds. The denial of the need for developing personal righteousness is a choking weed that eventually, if uncorrected, would grow into the paganized Christian doctrine of instant guaranteed salvation. But thankfully, the impending restoration of the kingdom of God will prevent that any complete erosion of divine truths in this last generation of the ecclesial age. It is sometimes incorrectly presumed that one either has righteousness or they do not, that there are no degrees of righteousness. That is a heart-generated and instinctive misconception that is easily and repeatedly proven to be false all through Scripture. The variable nature of our personal righteousness can be scripturally proven in that always necessary three-dimensional validation procedure. The only way to even qualify as having any level of personal righteousness is to have demonstrated our Creator's righteousness, His rightness, in our personal or individual words and deeds. It is this individual degree of God's righteousness being demonstrated by us personally, individually, that explains why Scripture constantly uses personal possessive pronouns in reference to righteousness. In other words, my righteousness, your righteousness, his righteousness, their righteousness, and our righteousness. It isn't possible to distinguish any righteousness whatsoever that actually could be separate from our Creator, but if we do not personally demonstrate His righteousness in our lives, then we have no possible or legitimate hope for salvation whatsoever. Jesus highlights the variable nature of personal righteousness when He delivers this warning in Matthew chapter 5, uh, where He says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. If the personal righteousness we individually generate in our pursuit of that image and likeness of God does not exceed the minimal personal righteousness that the scribes and Pharisees generated, then our hope of entering the kingdom of God has no basis in reality. Now, one's heart may prompt a desperate defensive claim that the Pharisees had no righteousness whatsoever. So therefore, anything is better than nothing. Uh, this, is, this is often based on the inappropriate presumption that one either is or is not a righteous person, and that there are no variable degrees of righteousness. Jesus disagreed with that false presumption, when he advised his disciples to do what these spiritual leaders of the enlightened community told them to do. We read in Matthew chapter 23, um, the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus says, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So Jesus tells us the scribes and Pharisees were saying 
the right things. They just weren't doing the right things. They had a degree of rightness, but not nearly enough. Jesus warns us that just a little personal righteousness will not be enough for salvation. Another very clear demonstration of the variable nature of personal righteousness would be God's judgment exception for three specific men with considerable personal righteousness. In Ezekiel 14, we read, uh, God says, um, uh, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall not, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but uh, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Yahweh declares that the levels of righteousness personally possessed by these faithful men had a power to save. But in the context of the extreme wickedness of that body of believers, that enlightened community of that generation, the value of that righteousness that they could call their own could not be extended to anyone beyond themselves, therefore highlighting the personal aspect of their own righteousness. Our personal pursuit of Yahweh's rightness can certainly be differentiated between ourselves um, uh, in a community, which, which is what qualifies it as being personal, but it can never be separated from Yahweh, as then it wouldn't qualify as righteousness at all, but only sin. As we've reviewed, sin is defined as the absence of righteousness uh, from 1 John 5. God identified the saving nature of the righteousness of Noah, Job, and Daniel as being their individual righteousness. This use of possessive personal pronouns in relation to righteousness is very common all through Scripture, as we noted, such as my as as we noted already in the in the use of my righteousness, our righteousness, your righteousness, as, as God said to Ezekiel, their righteousness. Since this is so easy to prove, one wonders how so many teachers in our community can confidently promote that there is no such thing as personal righteousness, and that the only only imputed righteousness is actually legitimate. Shouldn't we be challenging and objecting to such easily disproven claims? In Deuteronomy 6, uh, we read uh, where God says, and it shall, oh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Moses says, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Moses notes the righteousness, that, that that righteousness is personally owned based on one's individual performance of divine commandments. Moses certainly believed in personal righteousness. His use of the personal, the plural possessive personal pronoun, our, certainly identifies a personally identified status of righteousness. Moses' concept of personally assigned righteousness certainly didn't eliminate Yahweh from that righteousness equation. The only qualification for any degree of righteousness is the rightness of Yahweh in the first place. In 2 Samuel 22, uh, David, write, David says, uh, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, as he recompensed me. David relates his personal blessings directly to the righteousness he expresses as belonging to himself, using the personal, uh, possessive personal pronoun, my. David's righteousness was not somehow separate from Yahweh. It was on the basis of David demonstrating Yahweh's righteousness in his life. Therefore, it was David's personal righteousness, as opposed to the righteousness of Saul, or Joab, or Asaph, or Ahithophel, or anyone else. In Psalm 7, and uh, we read uh, where David says, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according and according to mine integrity that is in me. 
David accepts the fact that God will judge him according to his own righteousness, his personally identified righteousness, separate from other men, but, but not possible to be separated from God. It's impossible to separate rightness from our Creator, but it's certainly not impossible to separate one believer's pursuit of God's rightness from another believer. And that is the basis for the possessive personal pronoun application that we are noting. In Isaiah 54, we read, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. God defines through Isaiah in what sense personal righteousness can be assigned, using the possessive personal pronoun, their righteousness, Yahweh declares that the righteousness assigned to his servants is derived from him. This is exactly the same sense as Moses and David identifying personal righteousness on the basis of personally operating according to the divine standards of rightness, as opposed to other individuals or groups within the enlightened community that do not. We read in Ezekiel 18, uh, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and, and dies in them for his iniquity that he has done, shall he die? Again, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and does that which is lawful and right, he shall save his, own, his soul alive. Because he considered and turned away from all his transgressions that he has committed, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet, saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Our Creator declares that just as we can have personally assigned wickedness, we can also have personally assigned righteousness, which he defines as doing what is lawful and right. Isn't it interesting that the body of believers accuse Yahweh of inequity in his judgments on the basis of this foundational understanding? When Christadelphians deny the possibility of personally assigned levels of righteousness, are we not initiating the same exact challenge to our Creator? Is it wise to challenge our Creator's judgments? Now, you can also look at Ezekiel 33, verses 12 to 20, where Israel contested God's right to judge on the basis of their consistent or inconsistent performance of righteousness, as if we should all be equal in the divine estimation, no matter our behavior or demonstrated intensity of faith or lack thereof. This is exactly the same incorrect teaching that is being increasingly presented in the enlightened community today, all over again. We are repeatedly warned that we will be judged by Christ on the basis of our individual works and words. In other words, our demonstrations of our Creator's rightness, or the absence of those personal demonstrations. All three judgment parables in Matthew 25 emphasize this works feature of our impending judgment. The five unwise wedding attendants were rejected not because of what they actually had done wrong or might have, what might have been unforgiven, but what they had not done right. The lazy wicked servant who lied about being frozen in fear simply, simply did not do anything right or wrong. The basis by which the sheep were defined as righteous in Christ's judgment parable in Matthew 25 was because they fed the hungry brethren of Christ and clothed the naked brethren of Christ and tended to his sick family. They were righteous on the basis of demonstrating the right principles of the Heavenly Father. While faith can also separately assign a category of righteousness, which is imputed righteousness, it is not exclusive. And that oversimplification is the consistent tripping point in misunderstanding the two categories of every single divine principle. Individual behavior that demonstrates the exclusive divine standard for what is right is 
can also qualify for the assignment of a separate and equally necessary category of righteousness. It is very, very dangerous to deny that second righteousness category of personal righteousness, as that was the exclusive reason our Savior was actually saved in the first place. Jesus earned salvation, not on the exclusive basis of being completely without transgressions. I mean, babies that die are also without transgression, but they don't come back to life. Jesus demonstrated his Father's righteousness in all that he did and said, no matter the pressure. Unlike us, Jesus was not dependent on any imputed righteousness. If we respect the growing number of false teachers in our enlightened community today, insisting there is no such thing as personal righteousness, then we are denying the very qualification for our Messiah's own salvation. That is, that is not an inconsequential mistake. One of the problems with the Jewish frame of reference was their illegitimate presumption that personal righteousness exclusively constituted the path of salvation. The exact opposite is true for today's corrupted, paganized Christianity understandings, that exclusively imputed righteousness is all that's needed for salvation. Both understandings are absolutely wrong because they are each incomplete. We need both personally generated as well as imputed righteousness, or we will not be invited to inherit the kingdom. We are not free to claim that, that we have faith and therefore deserve salvation, presuming that there's no responsibility on our part to prove that faith by personally generating demonstrations of our Creator's rightness in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. That would be a denial of one of the great themes expressed through both divine witnesses of the Bible and creation. That would be the lesson of fruitfulness. The enlightened community is expected to bear fruit to the honor of the Creator's glory, but we'll have more to say about the relationship between personal fruitfulness and personal righteousness in just a few minutes. Our next reasoning task will be to understand righteousness from the divine perspective. Righteousness is not some ethereal, mystical condition that one either has or doesn't have. There's, there are degrees to righteousness. Righteousness is simply rightness, the practice of being right. It just isn't all that difficult to understand. The constraining condition for what constitutes being right is that there's only one standard for what is right. Our Creator is always right, 100% of the time. While righteousness is fairly easy to define basically, it isn't always easy to understand specifically, as Yahweh's judgments can certainly challenge the presumptions of the fleshly mind. The instant incineration of Nadab and Abihu for a, a just a ritual modification has to be balanced against the fact that not only was their father's golden calf production sin forgiven, but in addition, he was appointed the high priest of God's people. And that was certainly a problem for brothers Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, very respected brethren in the enlightened community, but because they could not accept the rightness of Aaron's appointment, they were buried alive along with their wives and most of their children. We also have to balance how a young man picking up firewood on a Saturday morning had to be bludgeoned to death by stones, uh, with stones, by his family. But Jesus declares that his disciples were guiltless for harvesting grain for personal consumption on a Saturday. Achan and his whole family and animals are stoned to death and then burned because Achan took some spoil from Jericho. But King David is forgiven for his adultery and contract murder of Uriah. It is not always easy 
to balance the judgments and determinations of our Creator. However, if we can't understand how seemingly contradictory judgments can both be right to be righteous, then the problem is with our thinking, not with Yahweh. He is always right. When the enlightened faithful think, act, and speak in ways that align with and project that invariable rightness of Yahweh, then we also are right, but only on the basis of our agreement with and personal demonstrations of that exclusive standard for righteous, rightness, for righteousness. When we exhibit this divinely right thinking and behavior and words, then that rightness standard, status can be considered our own, individually, personally, as opposed to being shared with others among the enlightened who may not be thinking, acting, and speaking in the same divine rightness validating manner. The personal aspect of the principle of personal righteousness is never scripturally presented as being some different standard of righteousness than our Creator, as it is sometimes defensively and emotionally emphasized by some within our enlightened community. This distinction of personal righteousness and its contribution to the framework of our salvation opportunity is not inconsequential. Our Creator is searching for people who recognize, understand, and appreciate His counterintuitive truths and principles and are willing to sacrifice temporary advantages, comforts, relationships, to cling desperately to His principles of what is true, what is right. He, he wants to see himself in us, just, just like we appreciate seeing ourselves in our own sons and daughters and grandchildren. Our Creator's expectation of an appropriate behavioral response that righteousness emulation on a personal level from the introduction of enlightened understanding is demonstrated powerfully in the features of creation, creational testimony, as that principle of fruitfulness that we noted earlier. Uh, the creational testimony of fruitfulness is yet another of those three-dimensional validations of the fact that there are two categories to this divine principle of righteousness, just as there are two categories to all divine principles. It is never one or the other but both that have to be respected and balanced. Our Creator is the ultimate husbandman. He sowed mankind into his vast creation project. Man was the focal point of the entire project, being originally made in God's image and likeness and given authority over everything that was made. Unfortunately, that likeness was not maintained by the failure due to the serpent challenge to God's testimony. Therefore, both the divine likeness and divine, the divine image were forfeited. Our current energy-fading, uh, diseased, waste-generating, and decaying human nature is certainly not a representation of the divine image nor could it even qualify for the original divine approval status of being simply very good prior to that first creation corrupting sin. The parable of the agricultural process in the current degraded creation order is a validation of the scriptural principle of this expected personal and individual projection of divine righteousness, the fruit that the husbandman has a right to expect, after cultivating and preparing the ground, planting good seed, fertilizing, watering, weeding, nurturing. This divine expectation of fruitfulness absolutely saturates both avenues of divine testimony, both the Bible and creation. 
the enlightened community is constantly parallel to fruit-bearing plant life throughout the Bible, such as barley, uh, that first fruits that were waved uh, as bare grain at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the wheat, which was the harvest associated with the Feast of Weeks, uh, the vineyard, olive trees, figs, fig trees. However, the unenlightened are exclusively paralleled to uh, non-fruit-bearing um, plants, plant life, such as briars and thorns, grass. Uh, the refusal of the enlightened to live by the right standards of Yahweh is defined in terms of fruitlessness, barrenness, and famine. We've noted in previous presentations how the three divinely appointed harvest feast weeks in each a uh, year under the laws of the kingdom of God, served as a perfect projection, detailed, sharp shadows, projection of the three great immortalization events in the divine plan, extending the validation of our creational testimony demonstration that personal fruitfulness, the, that individual and personal projection of divine righteousness, will be a basis for divine acceptance, which is repeatedly represented through the, throughout the Bible as harvesting the fruit from a mature, productive plant. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a crisp, highly defined ritual shadow of the harvesting, the immortalization of our Messiah. The Feast of Weeks, that second first fruits feast uh, that was the wheat harvest, is an absolutely perfect shadow projection of the first immortalization of the saints at the beginning of the kingdom, just, just as Jesus defines the restoration of God's kingdom as the harvest of the wheat and the tares, in his parable in Matthew 13. The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of the Final Ingathering, is a shadow prophecy of the third and last divine harvesting, that third immortalization scheduled for the eighth divine day after creation, and it will follow the conclusion of the Millennial Kingdom. A key feature in each of these three harvest celebrations is the common requirement that no one was allowed to participate in these harvest celebrations if they had nothing to offer God. Being fruitless was not an acceptable option. Um, one of the, we, a couple of places are noted here, but we'll read Deuteronomy 16, where God says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he has given thee. Absolutely no one was allowed to appear before God at harvest time with nothing to offer. They were to give as they were able, projecting the same judgment rule of much being required of those who have been given much. The poor could give less, and the rich were expected to give more. But no one could come empty-handed, exactly projecting the principle of personal righteousness, that we had better not arrive at our judgment, presuming imputed righteousness is all that we need, without having tried as hard as we could to personally demonstrate God's righteousness in our thinking, our words, and our deeds, which are the fruits the divine husbandman expects at harvest. And that harvest is Christ's judgment. The consequences for failing to provide that expected fruitfulness, uh, the personal demonstrations of our Creator's righteousness, are emphasized in a number of parables presented by God and Christ. Uh, Isaiah presents the song of his well-beloved uh, in chapter 5, addressing how the vineyard uh, God had carefully planted and tended only yielded wild grapes. That unfruitful vineyard is defined as Israel and Judah, the enlightened community of Isaiah's generation. 
the judgment for failing to produce good fruit was for the vineyard to be trodden down and laid waste. Jesus presents the parable of the tenants of God's vineyard in Matthew 21, who refused to provide the fruits of the vineyard to the owner. Uh, the tenants beat his servants and even killed the vineyard owner's son. The judgment was that those wicked men should be miserably destroyed. The leaders of the enlightened community instantly recognized that that parable was directed at them. Jesus tells the parable of the unfruitful fig tree. If it will not yield fruit, no matter how much effort is invested, the judgment was that the fruitless tree should be cut down. These are all shadows of the divine principle that the saints will have faithfully developed personal righteousness, that fruit, to the honor and glory of the Creator, because these members of the enlightened community truly love God with all their heart, strength, and life. And they want to participate in the salvation that he offers. Another scriptural shadow of these same two righteousness categories is the white wedding robes of the Bride of Christ. These wedding garments are actually identified as representing both righteousness aspects. Uh, these wedding garments symbolize the covering of immortalization, which is what atonement means to, to cover. In the same sense that the first two salvation arcs were double covered inside and out. Noah's uh, salvation ark was double covered in pitch, actually using the same Hebrew verb translated as making an atonement throughout the Old Testament. The salvation ark of Moses was also double covered in gold. Jesus, the substance casting these two shadow arcs, also offers that dual atonement covering in both the forgiveness of sins and the cleansing covering uh, of, of immortality and incorruptibility. A feature of the creational testimony emphasizing the significance of this repeated scriptural identification of the covering aspect of atonement would be that human beings are the exclusive species in all of creation that actually covers our naked creative forms, created forms, and we do this to avoid the shame of nakedness, just as our original ancestors did in the Garden of Eden when death was first imposed. We can hear this identification of these white wedding robes uh, of the saints as representing the covering of immortalization in Revelation chapter 7. And we read, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Uh, this is clearly an expression of imputed righteousness seen in these white robes, as it is the blood of our Messiah that has whitened these robes that are being awarded to the saints. However, in Revelation 19, we're told these same white robes represent the righteous deeds performed by the saints. Uh, we read, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife his ecclesial wife, has made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. These robes are defined as the righteousness belonging to the saints who were awarded these coverings, these bridal gowns of the saints. Now, most translations uh, read the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, this is obviously that first of the two righteousness categories, personal righteousness, the individual deeds and works that are repeatedly expressed as being the terms of our own judgment. We should recall 
uh, the be able to recall that uh, Christ's parable of the wedding of the king's son, where there was a man found to be attending who had the audacity to come without a wedding garment, without that personal righteousness covering, having insufficient righteous deeds to cover him. And he was cast out of the wedding, and there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. So those who are invited to the wedding of God's Son will be rejected if they had not labored to generate that level of righteous deeds that exceeds the shallow righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees who say the right things but don't do the right things. The last warning Jesus offers at the conclusion of this specific wedding parable is truly unsettling. He declares that many are called, obviously meaning called to the wedding, meaning to judgment, but only a few of those called are actually going to be chosen. Sadly, many in our community inappropriately deflect the significance of this warning by arrogantly ripping this warning right out of the context to presume that they have been chosen by God for enlightenment. That's a lie. God never selectively chooses anyone for enlightenment. He chooses for people for assignments, uh, but not enlightenment. God has declared that he would prefer, Timothy, that as Paul says to Timothy, that everyone, he'd prefer that everyone come to an understanding of the truth and be saved. So if God truly selectively chose people for enlightenment, that would make him a liar and a hypocrite. This judgment parable conclusion is a warning from our judge that despite many being called to the judgment, being invited to the wedding of the king's son, in reality, only a few will be chosen by Jesus Christ. That is a truly unsettling warning. This personal righteousness issue is why Peter explains that it's those who have energetically demonstrated God's righteousness in their deeds and works that will be saved. And 1 Peter 4, uh, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And Jesus is the one who taught this to Peter. Jesus told Peter, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. When we have the substance of our Creator's righteousness understood correctly, the shadow testimony he offers those with seeing eyes and hearing ears will always validate those correct understandings from every direction, all three dimensions. Clearly, there are two separate categories of the divine principle of righteousness, just like life, death, sin, atonement, and also just like all the other divine principles. Uh, we will be continuing this theme in our next Visions of the Kingdom Age presentation, where we will consider the dual applications of other divine principles, which is why the cherubim, those shadow representations of the immortalized Christ and the saints, have that two cloven foot foundation. The number two serves as the mathematical symbol for spiritual balance. This is why it takes two to go from six to eight, from death to eternal life. This pattern is, is far too extensive and perfectly consistent to ignore or to dismiss as inconsequential. In these final days, before we face our eternal judgment, we need to be careful to beware the false testimony that's being promoted within the enlightened community that the single application of righteousness is imputed righteousness. Only simply on the basis of faith, and even just a little bit of faith that doesn't even need works to ensure that it is a living faith. Now, we should be 
energetically pursuing. All of our opportunities to understand and demonstrate the terms of our Creator's righteousness.